um, be involved. So that would be great. Um, I'm Eve Ekman. I'm your teacher guide friend this evening. Really happy to be with you all. Um, this, this I will say, goes goes into that bucket that gets ever wider of some of my all-time favorite slogans we're working with tonight. It's just such a, I have to say, it's almost a little bit cheating for me because this slogan encapsulates like the last 10 years of my work um, and what I'm interested in. And so I'm really um, excited for the opportunity for us to deepen it together. And we will start with a meditation. Uh, we will talk then about this slogan. The meditation itself relates to the slogan. So in this course of uh, going through our slogans, we're up to 55, kind of amazing. Um, so in all 55 slogans, we're getting these pith instructions to turn or change the mind. So this isn't you know, a multi-page book or even one of many volumes. These are these simple slogans that each one helps us turn and change our mind. And in the process of turning and changing our mind, we're, we're also kind of training ourselves in the meditations that can really support us. And in the, in the uh, time that we've all been together, we've been focusing on the meditations that have to do with getting into that settled state of mind. So settling the mind in its natural state and having that sense of openness, sometimes called having that sense of stillness amid movement. And then we've also been focusing on Tonglen incredible transformative practice of turning towards what's hard and transforming it into the very uh, kind of material of your liberation. And with Tonglen, we open up towards, we open up with what is hard and difficult in our lives in this world and for other beings. And with Tonglen, there's a real kind of, um, there's an effort, a beautiful effort, an aspiration of transformation what we're going to practice tonight is almost a precursor to Tonglen and certainly a precursor to settling the mind in its natural state. And that's the practice of handshaking with our emotions. So those of you who uh, know me a bit know that I just love this practice. It's a practice that Sokni Rinpoche created largely to help his students who they just kind of got stuck just stuck along the way of trying to have that clear mind and open heart. They're kind of all the unmetabolized material of their daily lives, all their, you know, grudges against one another, all the feelings of unworthiness it just gets in the way. And of course we can practice Tonglen with that material. Sometimes that's too hard. Sometimes we don't feel that we deserve to send ourselves compassion, or sometimes it just gets a little transactional and we're like, yeah, yeah, may I be nicer to myself, may I be nicer to other people, but it doesn't actually land. With the handshake practice, we really just settle in and stick with the experience of the emotion. And it takes a bit of faith. And the faith is that the emotion will liberate itself. And it takes a little bit of trust. And it actually means showing up for our difficult emotions without an expectation or an agenda. So not like I'm gonna to turn towards this difficult emotion in order for it to change. But it really is creating space around that difficult emotion as a practice in and of itself. That's it. And the way he says it that I love so much, he says, I'm here willing to suffer with you. I'm not here trying to make this emotion change. I'm not here um, <clears throat> just trying to get through. If it takes a lifetime to get through this emotion, I'm here for it. And that handshake practice is, is so useful. Of course, we'll do it together as a meditation, but we can do it at any moment. It's very hard to remember. But when we have that tug or that tightness, that feeling of jealousy or anxiety or frustration, can we hang in with it? It's really interesting, this slogan. So the, the slogan, I'll put it here in the chat, number 55. Let's see here. Liberate yourself by examining and analyzing. 
gain freedom through discernment and analysis. So this slogan is really inviting us to turn towards the emotions in the way of our awakening, in the way of what's kind of um, preventing us. So I just think it's a really, it's such, a, it's such an amazing slogan to practice handshake with. And we'll get a little bit more into the commentary, but Pema Chodron says that this slogan reminds us that it's the path of a warrior, the seeing and liberating and examining. She says that if we can see what we do without turning it against ourselves. So I think what prevents most of us from wanting to sit with our emotions is we take it personal. It seems to define who we are and is like a judgment we create about ourselves. So I'm giving you this a little bit of an extended preamble because I, I want to point out the areas we can get stuck in this practice. We can really, you know, have a sense of, <clears throat> okay, now I'm connecting with this difficult emotional experience and I can't believe that I can't let it go. What's wrong with me? Why am I feeling this again? I thought I liberated this already. How many times do I have to practice Tonglen in order for this to resolve? So just to remember in this practice, we're just opening up, opening up to what's here. Um, I was very fortunate to sit on an online retreat with Sukhni Rinpoche last week and just so inspired by his clarity and his, um, his dedication to his students and reminding us over and over and over that there's no kind of feeling of freedom and joy that's outside of being with our difficult emotions. Like we actually have to include them in order to have that real sense of freedom. So that's, that's what I'm gonna invite us to do. So <clears throat> for this practice, you are absolutely welcome to lie down, to say sitting up and finding a posture that is supportive and comfortable for you. If it's comfortable to have your eyes softly open, that's great. You're welcome to kind of turn your screen or dim your actual screen just so you can feel a little bit of that um, sense of relief. Let's connect to our posture and find a posture that really invites the full dignity of being in meditation together. Can you even imagine us gathered in person, sitting once again in a room? There's a way that we hold ourselves in community. So invite that feeling of being connected right here into your posture. Drop as much as possible your thinking mind into the space of your body. Help your mind keep settling by focusing on the breath. Noticing and traveling with the breath as it enters through the nostrils. And then returns once again out through the nostrils.
as you focus on the breath, be if you can just gently imagine softening your gaze, whether your eyes are closed or partially open. Invite this incredible sense door of sight to relax and release even further. We'll take a moment here to connect to an intention and aspiration. Traditionally, we like to awaken and enliven our bodhicitta, our awakened heart. Remembering that we do this meditation not only for ourselves, but for the liberation and peace, the joy, for all beings. And our intention can be quite personal. All of us here <clears throat> on our own healing journey on this planet, consider an intention and aspiration that feels meaningful right here right now. Release your focus on this intention. And again, come into feeling in the space of the body. First, <clears throat> feeling our body supported by the ground beneath us. Our body always needs to be supported. And in this moment, just bringing an awareness to that support and to the very weight and materiality of this body. And connect to the sense of temperature in the body. Maybe parts of your body are a little cooler, exposed to the air. Maybe other areas feel warm and cozy. And of course, if you're uncomfortable or there's an itch, you're welcome to move mindfully. But consider inviting a quality of stillness to the body. Such an alive stillness in the body as our breath enters and undulates and leaves.
It's okay if you get distracted and your mind wanders. Just relax and release and return to focusing just a bit longer here on stilling the body, settling the mind into the body. And then gently shifting our attention from the body as a whole, what is often called the gross body, not gross as in disgusting, but gross as in just the form, the physicality, and moving from this gross form body to our subtle body. The subtle body is the energies and emotions and then experiences that exist within. And our subtle body is where we might feel our emotional residue. The material that is lingering around from something that might have happened earlier today or a familiar cycle or pattern that has happened throughout your life. So take a moment here and, and notice what might be here. What emotions might be present in the subtle body? If there's not much of a feeling, that's also a feeling. If the feeling is strong, <clears throat> maybe a hollowing of grief or an intensity and warmth of anger, also good. We begin by simply investigating and noticing what's here. As much as possible, try not to get caught up in the story. We'll have time for that later. For now, we're just connecting to the feeling. And as we shake hands with what's here, Our attitude is one of openness and acceptance. We aren't trying to ignore or avoid. Just simply being with. 
in that being, there is some knowing, but we're not trying to figure it out. Where are these feelings and emotions in the body? Notice as they shift and change. And feel or imagine that there was enough space for any sensation that arose. whether it is subtle or strong. Continue bringing your attention and awareness and feel or imagine that the body can host whatever arises. Invite the body to be relaxed, the heart to be open, the mind clear, bright. Maybe a thought arises, bringing with it a full new emotion experience. Just relax, release, and notice the experience and sensations of the emotion in the subtle body. Are the sensations of the emotions shifting and changing, unfolding, maybe dissipating? Our emotions don't last forever. They come and they go, especially if we can lean back, give them space. As our emotions gently and slowly unwind and move, we may become aware of something which is always just beneath. In the sense of just being okay. Not coming from the outside, okay coming from the inside. Basic okayness. 
maybe it even feels a bit stronger, happy, happy without a cause. It's okay if it's hard to connect with the okayness or the happiness. But just like looking at a sky full of clouds, knowing the sun is behind it. And consider the possibility that this is there, just behind whatever worries or frustrations or dullness might be in the forefront. Just a couple more moments here. <clears throat> Shaking hands with what's here. No agenda, no rush. Willing to suffer with whatever is here. Because whatever is here, you can make space around. Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> so I'd be curious to hear from folks, any reflections or questions or thoughts. You can raise your hand or write in the chat or unmute yourself. <clears throat> Laura, please. I have a very neurotic and uh, very um, in a hurry voice in my head. You know, like a feeling of kind of always, you know, I sort of refer to it as I'm, I'm from New York originally. It's like my inner New Yorker, like get out of my way. Like I'm in a hurry, like kind of, a, um, you know, <laughs> always critical, always. And it kind of sits there and sometimes I have a hard time with her, um, both when I'm meditating and just walking around in the world. And I. I sort of realized like this is just a thing there and I try to I'm trying to figure out kind of how to work with this part of myself because um I, I find it really hard hmm. really really hard um you know I did find in the practice a little bit like just saying it's okay it's all right you know nice to see you it was kind of helpful but that yeah that sense of like how do I both like plan for the future and be present all at once? Like, how am I, you know, moving forward and sitting still? And it's like mm -hmm. this weird contradiction. 
You're so not alone. <laughs> You're so not alone. So many of us have our, our New Yorker or equivalent of, um, of that planning, that planning mind, that kind of vigilance, right? That, um, and it's, 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 it is not a problem. Um, in practice and in life, it, it can be distracting. Um, I'm curious, were you able to identify like felt sensation when you connected yes. with her? Absolutely, absolutely. There's definitely like a kind of tenseness in the body, mm -hmm. uh, in, up in the, the face and, you know, a, a kind of anxiety in the heart, you know, they're, they're, I, I, anxiety is the real word, a stress, a tightness. Yeah. And when you focus on it, does it does some space? Like, is there, does it move? Yeah, it, it does. It, it can calm a bit when I, I try and, yeah, say like, oh, yeah, this is like this thing. Actually, my toe is not nervous. It feels fine. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, it's not the only thing I'm feeling. And so sometimes that can help. Um, yeah. And I, I keep hearing you, um, which is very common, use like cognitive strategies. You know, like, it's okay. I'm okay. And with handshake, um, the invitation is really just being with the sensations. It's like a little different. And I, I think there's something about that. It's like, it's, it's like pre-kindergarten, <laughs> you know? And for most of us, we need like a pre like we, it's like we're so developed when it comes to ideas, analysis, strategy. But like being in the felt experience of the body for most of us is like, I'm hungry or I'm tired. What else is happening? And to develop this other language and this other fluency where, you know, it's like, oh, it's tight. Like you're saying, like, it's tight. Like, what does that even mean? What does it mean to have tight? And to get um, curious in that way, that is actually a strategy. So it'll help your planning mind to know it's a strategy, um, but to kind of like give, um, give a full, like as much as possible, like a full uh, attention to the sensations <clears throat> without a, um, without even that kind of encouragement of like, it's okay, or I'm okay. Cause I think it's, it's interesting, like with, with, generating that ability to kind of touch into the tactile felt sensation of emotion, <clears throat> we can actually get blocked along the way by kind of trying to change it or fix it or, or have it um, go fast or go slow. And yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've been doing this practice. Um, I learned this practice from Sokni, I think um, in 2013 um, and definitely have been growing up with it. And I realized that there's like a, um, a real wisdom to how kind of pre-kindergarten he keeps it. Like, it's so simple. It's so simple. It's almost like just being with sense perception. Like, what is this just, what does this feel like? Um, and then the invitation, which I offered there, which, which he also offers and is very common in, in Tibetan teaching is this idea of our, our basic okayness also. Like that's the only uh, kind of strategy is just, is there anything that's okay? Maybe amid or behind or within um, this experience. I hope that's helpful. And the, the great part about this practice is you really can do it on the spot. Um, so it's really interesting to try it out um, in the wild. While I'm about to throw a harsh criticism at that person yes. keeping me from moving forward. Exactly. Right there. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, I see from uh, Geneva here. I discovered some fear hiding behind frustration and anger. It almost felt like a relief to discover the fear. Acknowledging the fear opened things up and allowed me to see a whole picture instead of just my story. Wow, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, I mean, I, I was thinking about this the other day, just how many things happen to us in any given day, even a relatively boring day, <clears throat> that we are not processing at a conscious level. We're just kind of like, yep, can't deal with that, moving on, can't deal with that, moving on, can't deal with that, moving on. And um, 
it's almost like tartar gets like built up on our hearts. And um, I do think, you know, that insight around anger being kind of a mask or kind of, um, you know, maybe shielding us from other more tender or vulnerable places can be part of that buildup. Um, or we can have just straight up plain old anger um, in there too, and giving ourselves that time. I think, you know, this um, shaking hands with our body, which in the scientific literature is called interoception or embodied awareness of our emotion. Very highly correlated with um, feeling a sense of overall well being, also feeling a sense of connection to others. Isn't that interesting? The more that we can sense and have that experience of being connected in our bodies, the more we feel connected to others. It's kind of duh, but I think it's really interesting. Um, I know for myself, one way I definitely lose connection with my body is kind of going up and out towards another person, either, you know, wanting to enjoy with them or please them or whatever it is. And this idea that I can actually be more present with them in my body, um, quite inspiring. Any other questions, comments, reflections? Yeah, Karen, hi. Hi, Eve. Uh, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more about what you said about um, having a little faith when doing this practice. Um, just, I guess, maybe I'm a little impatient for some of these to sort of unwind a little bit. And I was just curious if you could say more about um, having that faith. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a beautiful question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, I think, I think meditation um, is a very beautiful way to have an agenda if you have an agenda, right? It's, it at least is um, fairly wholesome, right? Um, but many of us do come to practice because we are in distress, right? Whether we have our inner New Yorker um, who are like, could you leave me alone? Or uh, we're going through a big transition you know, of loss or um, otherwise. And it's really hard. I think it's, it's so counterintuitive to be like, I'm, I'm just here for whatever is happening and not hope of something. And so we go back to, I'm still gonna say it, my all time favorite Lojong slogan, which is to give up all hope of fruition. And it's just so like, that just, it slays so beautifully that slogan because it reminds us not to give us, give up hope, but of how it should be. So we still need that enthusiasm and that presence in our practice. And yet as much as possible, we try to unwind an idea of, of how it will be. So I think that's kind of one, one way of it. And then, you know, there is, and Sophie talks about this a lot. I, I don't know the equivalents in psychology um, like contemporary psychology, but this idea that your difficult emotions know when you have an agenda. And, you know, again, without the scientific evidence that feels true to me, <laughs> like when they, when my difficult emotions know that I'm like being kind and shaking hands, but really I just want them to get out of the way. I feel as though there's like resistance, you know, there's kind of a like, like a digging in, um, you know, it makes sense that just a very, a basic level, he so he uses a lot of like um, hand gestures, right? So he, he's, he'll be like shaking hands isn't like, you know, this really tight thing. It's like very loose, like you can pull away at any time. Um, and how important it is for us to have that like light touch with our difficult emotions. You know, it's interesting too, we think of um, feeding your demons, which I know many of you have done here with Chandra or others. There's also a level of faith in, I'm going to turn towards what's hard because I believe that it will transform me. Um, and, um, and it will. Um, for some of you who way back in the day, maybe remember we started the Feeding Your Demon study uh, in 2018. <clears throat> We're finally, uh, I'm not going to say finally, the paper is almost done. <laughs> Takes a long time. And we've been analyzing that data and um, especially analyzing people's written experiences. And something I find so moving is one of the main themes that's coming up as we code this data is um, trust in oneself and a sense of empathy for the demon. 
So this idea of like, I, you know, um, recognize that these parts of myself that are hard are parts of myself that I just don't include or parts of myself that wanted to protect me at one point or, you know, so that's, we're going in like with feeding your demons, you get into the really um, like applied territory of, of, of analysis, which is great also. Um, but I do think it's, it can, we can even bring that knowingness into our practice of for me to do this handshake and for, I mean, the emotion essentially is supposed to self liberate like without forcing <clears throat> it just releases all on its own. And I think that's a really weird idea until we have that direct experience of, of watching it just go on its own. I think we've been, um, we believe that we have to do something or kind of get in the way or interfere, or make sure it doesn't uh, keep going. But the, the natural kind of um, manifestation of an emotion, it will come and go. And, you know, whatever, whatever words help, I, I do like this idea that they, they self-liberate or they kind of purify with space. They become less encumbered by our own, um, you know, um, kind of personal attachments to them. So when we talk about the difficult, disturbing emotions in the context of Buddhism, they're called kleshas. And they are like these defiling emotions that just kind of get in the way and that we are blind to not see how kind of immaterial they are. So in this practice, we're almost like we're, we're, we're paying such close attention that we can see the immateriality. We get like all the way up so we can see like the threads in the weave. We're like, oh, that's, that's not forever. That's not me. Um, so that was a very long answer. I hope some of it is useful, just pointing around the, the various pieces. But I think trying to like, without agenda, like notice how it changes is probably a really great way experientially. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? We're already happily getting a little bit into um, the slogan a bit. Yes, Claudia, hi. I'm kind of puzzled, Eve, because I do understand the what you're talking about, the embodiment of the emotions and being open to that. And I, I, I do feel them in my body and I just... If they don't disappear completely, they dissipate. But I'm wondering, in the interest of being a better bodhisattva, harming others, how, how does that happen? happen how does that get transformed because I'm, I'm thinking specifically for example with me my issue is anger and it just uh i mean i read the the, the logic for tonight and i felt like wow this is really deep i mean of mm. of analyzing it from my perspective other people's perspectives the past the present the future the everything and i'm like is that how we eventually get to like the deeper understanding and changing because mm. I mean, for me, it's, I've been working on it, but it's like a recurring thing, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so yeah, sometimes I do get down on myself. Yeah. God, damn it, you know, it keeps on coming back. I thought that I had already, you know, like really worked on that and it's been going away. So yeah, yeah. yeah elaborate on that yeah well really... thank you yeah sorry yeah <laughs> no i i appreciate um your transparency and honesty too you know it's um it is really disheartening to find ourselves you know contracted into our hab habitual emotional patterns right and it can happen um anytime like even when we're in like the most supportive conditions we can be like <clears throat> Um, and I, you know, I do think it's, you know, I do think there's different, so I'll kind of, um, 
I'll segue us into the slogan a bit because I think, you know, part of the slogan is identifying and analyzing and then also being aware of what are the antidotes that will work for us. Um, and antidote, it's such a beautiful word. <laughs> it does make it sound like emotions are poison and they're not. Um, though, of course, it can feel that way when we, you know, inadvertently harm someone because of our emotional experiences. Um, so this idea of antidote, it's really multifaceted and there isn't just one. Um, and I was really lucky to get to read up a bit on antidotes um, for that emotion summit last May. So there's a lot of talk around destructive emotions and antidotes and some of the antidotes are, um, so we have of course these, you know, uh, very well uh, trodden paths of certain emotion experiences and habits. But we can also like alongside those paths, we can like plant other experiences. So we can plant the seeds of loving kindness and compassion and empathetic, especially empathetic joy. So the idea is in addition to trying to like work with the difficulty and the charge of our destructive emotions, we're at the same time cultivating these positive, pro-social, enjoyable emotions. And I like that. I like, because I, I resonate with you a lot, like, give me some other strategies. <laughs> like, what are we going to do? And, um, you know, developing and continuing to you know, increase our positive and pro-social emotions. I think what it does is just helps get more of the dust off the gold of our heart. You know, I, I do have a sense that um, as the heart gets like shinier and brighter with just that intrinsic love, um, that just love of being, that love of um, our, our deeper nature, I think, I think, I hope, that we also have a little more ease with the things that get in the way. Another antidote is, is, and that's what we'll kind of move on to. And I know, you know, you've done a lot of this work in CEB is, is really more applied analysis. And the applied analysis includes what triggers this? What is it like when it's happening? How do I respond? Um, and for this slogan, the question is, you know, really getting clear, what are the contexts? Like, what are the cause and conditions that lead to this? <clears throat> and, you know, it, it doesn't elaborate as much as um, we do in cultivating emotional balance at CEB, but I, I think that part of understanding the context or the triggers to these difficult emotions is it will give us empathy. Because we know that like, whatever that anger is, we learned it a long time ago. And maybe it's not even ours. You know, maybe we we kind of got it from our family, right? And so with that, I feel there's a little bit of a, you know, not only are we getting clear in the context that maybe we can avoid, or we can prevent some of those, like, gosh, I'm just not going to get myself in those situations anymore. Um, but of course, we can't do that with everything. And I think alongside that, we're getting that more compassionate view to hold ourselves in because we know that we're not alone. I mean, all of us are really struggling to um, have as much balance in our life emotionally as we can. And we see that, you know, this early little part of us very likely needed that strategy and we just are having a hard time outgrowing it. it takes, you know, that's, I think, all, all therapeutic intervention and practices are based on that really simple understanding that a lot of these habits we learn early on or these parts of ourselves that we have early on, um, they just become so deeply, um, yeah, so deeply kind of woven into how we respond to the world. It's like trying to, <clears throat> trying to pay attention to your breath really hard because we do it all the time. We need to do it for survive. That's why it's so interesting using breath meditation to develop emotion awareness. Two things that happen unconsciously um, that we can develop practice, but man, I mean, how many breaths in a row can we really pay attention to before we get distracted? And with the emotions, it's just so fast. It's so fast. Um, I'm trying to remember, there was one other antidote I wanted to, to talk about. Um, Right. So 
handshake, <laughs> which we did. Um, and then um, also, you know, really practicing, and this is um, really interesting approach is really practicing on just the emptiness of the experience. And just having a sense that, you know, whatever specific causes and conditions have come together to feel that emotion, they are going to shift and change. And the emotion is formless. And so we can't do that in the emotion, but to really like kind of like familiarize ourselves and to have a kind of um, a close connection, like these emotions, they are so impermanent, they're formless. And if we think about that enough, like it's almost like we're, um, um, it's like we're, we're kind of like fertilizing our mind with that wisdom. And it just starts to kind of pierce and penetrate how we see reality. It can, you know, all of these are, are um, not sure things, but they, I think they, they are, approaches which have worked and have been um, tried for thousands of years. And, you know, I think the radical, the radical one, of course, with our most difficult emotions is treat them as guru. If we didn't have them, we probably wouldn't be here tonight. Let's be real. Like we'd be like, oh, I'm just going to veg out or whatever else, because if it wasn't for the challenges and difficulties those emotions present to us, most of us wouldn't spend as much time dedicating to our heart and mind, you know, as especially Claudia, I know you do. So that's a, that's when I, you know, I really struggle with that, but I, I know that there's a part of me that knows it. So I hope that's helpful. Very, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. You're so welcome. Yeah. 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 It, like when you say a guru is like, what is it that I have to learn from this emotion? What is its function, right? Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Just feels like there's some things we, I'm like, I'm done learning this, but I guess not, still coming. So yeah, other, other thoughts and questions <clears throat> around this, because what I'd like us to do is actually apply ourselves a bit um, to these questions. So the slogan, as I, I mentioned before, is um, liberate yourself by examining and analyzing, <clears throat> gain freedom through discernment and analysis. And what I think is interesting is um, the invitation and in the slogan is to examine our strongest emotions. And then to also really look at the situations that give rise to them. And the idea that, you know, there's just no way we can proceed on our lojong if we don't do this. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's really useful. I'm gonna put a couple questions in the chat um, that I came up with for, for, this, um, for this slogan. So what type, so, you know, the, the ask is <clears throat> identify and investigate your most common mental distortions and cliches. What types of things trigger it? What does it feel like in the body? How do you respond? Oops, are you angry or aggressive? Isn't meant to be there. And what might be the antidote? So I'm curious, does anybody know? It's Claudia just shared with us. She knows her most common. Who else knows their most common? Jenny. This is super timely because I'm looking a lot at when I shut down. I call them the get smart doors and they just, you know, so uh, I'm spending a lot of time with that. And fortunately, um, 
it's being triggered quite a bit. And uh, so it's really, I am in this analysis phase and looking at the strongest emotion, but then also seeing what the strongest emotion is keeping me from but how the strongest emotion also may be keeping me from some underlying very yeah. deep things that like super easy to be triggered and, 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 uh, and shut down. Yeah. Right. To avoid, but then like, to go like, Oh, wait a second. Okay. You know, and to see the fear, to see the confusion, to see. So yeah, super cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, again, it's like great insight to see shutting down is the response, right? So, okay. Um, which again, you are so not alone in that one. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Have you ever like done a handshake with shutting down like, with I'm the body? Doing, yeah. I'm doing that right now. I mean, it really, I had an incident last week and it just came right down and yeah, I just was like, okay, that's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's so interesting because in my experience of, of shutting down, um, there's actually quite a lot of sensation. Like I, I can block the thoughts, um, but the body itself is actually quite alive with yes. like quite a lot. And, right. Um, right. and so it's, you know, and again, like you said, it's okay. So can we like give our body even that invitation of like, I'm shut down, it's okay. And give space with that. Yeah. Like that's the real empathy for ourselves. Yeah. Not like, oh, why are you shutting down? Like there's other things like go to the, it's just that beauty of it. Um, and it's really tough, right? We do know that like the shutdown um, sometimes called, like, if you're especially interpersonally stonewalling, Right. So that when people are stonewalling or when they're kind of suppressing their emotions, physiologically, they are way more distressed. Yeah. So there's a lot more going on. Um, any insights on what might be an antidote? I mean, do you think there's like a antidote specifically to shut down? other than just being with? I think it's okay that, you know, because there's also a protective mechanism that is within that. When something is very hurtful that's happening, to be able to have that, allow the physical sensations. And the next morning I woke up and, and I, I, I was able to see that I was unnerved. I, I can't remember ever being unnerved. Hmm. but that was allowed to arise. It wasn't just shut down and, and. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 So in a way the, the shutdown, the response to the emotion um, allowed you to then kind of take the space so that it could arise and mm -hmm. shift and leave all on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. And that's why I feel like I'm happy, like with the antidotes, it never says like, use this one, um, that we are part of that process of trying to investigate and understand what works for us. Um, yeah, I, I think my antidote always, and I find myself saying it from, you know, with this situation to paddling out at OB if it's too big, relax into it, just relax into it. And that seems to be an antidote that works for me consistently in most every situation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is, it's funny, both uh, Sokni Rinpoche and Alan Wallace, two teachers I've sat with a lot, I'd say 95% of the questions people ask, that's their response. Relax. Mm -hmm. You could <laughs> relax. And they aren't just saying relax in um, the mind. Right. It is relax in the subtle body. Yeah. Yeah which is hard, right? It's like someone saying, just let go. And you're like, yeah, thanks. I'll yeah. let just let go. No, I, so I, how to, training and practice, just like this whole thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. <laughs>
Anyone else? Your common clashes. I was going to do breakout groups, but I lose some, we lose so many people. So I hope we're small enough that we can just share a little bit together. Hey, I can share mine. Hi, Lindsay. Great. Hi. It's so good to see you all. I haven't been able to be here in a while. It's really good to be here. Um, Eve, what you just said about, um, you know, having a lot, like a lot of things happening in your body, even when your exterior is very calm. Um, my thing that I have been working on for about 20 years and <laughs> continue to work on is um, going into like the quick slide for me between like feelings of shame or someone seeing me as not good. And then it just like flips before I notice. And I think I'm getting better at noticing what's happening, but it can often just go so quickly into just like straight up despair. And mm. um, something I've noticed in my relationship is that I can be on the surface very like oh you're upset with me yeah tell me about that I really want to hear that and I am tricking myself mm. but like I'm totally calm everything's good like I'm approaching this with curiosity and in my mind I'm mm. listing my good qualities to like buffer myself from the panic I'm actually feeling that someone's upset with me yeah um and that they think I'm bad. And um, it's really distressing because it's like, oh my God, I'm really good at, at buffering myself from my own panic. Yeah. And then it's like, before I realize, and of course, like that tightness, even though the words I'm saying, and I think I'm coming across as really like gentle and open, the tightness is really evident. Hmm. Yeah. And so I'm trying to work on um, seeing that sooner. And also, yeah, there's, and, and just being like, wow, you're still really disconnected from what's happening in your body. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I, I know at least I really resonate to that. And I imagine a lot of folks um, here tonight do as well. Like it's, um, yeah, I think that the more that I, um, the more that I highlight awareness of shame, the more shame there is, that at least that's what I find. And it is, um, you know, it's such an interesting, um, like what you're describing is such an interesting kind of insight. It's very subtle. So like you're able to kind of manage the presentation or you, or you think you are, um, but the body is just freaking out, right? So like our, it's like a, this, you know, little person who, who is worried and shame is such a powerful emotion because it's, it's a relational emotion. It directly involves our feeling as to whether or not we're lovable, right? Like we have shame around, will I be accepted? Will I be included? Will I be okay? And um, it just hits just even, you know, especially in the context of a, a relationship where, you know, um, usually the other person loves you, right? Like that's usually the thing. And yet they can still trigger that shame. Like we lose our awareness completely of their love and go into this entire other experience. Um, and, you know, I think bowing to the power of that emotion and just like, wow, wow, that is great. And I think in the context, especially of what you shared, um, having spent the time you've already spent exploring this emotion and exploring the body, I think with shame, you know, it really wants to be seen. It wants to be not hidden. Um, and so sharing it here is great. And then I think, you know, also doing that, like kind of planting alongside, 
like the shame is really, you know, exacerbated by this very deeply internalized view of not okay. So what are the subtle ways of just either unpacking the idea that there's an I, which that one's hard, but I think those practices are helpful, right? That remind us that there can't be shame when we really embrace just the ever-changing nature of human being. And then what I think might be even more helpful is like how much loving kindness can we actually give ourselves on a day-to-day basis and then like triple it, right? To just give ourselves instead of trying to kind of like continue to whack-a-mole, hit the shame down. Oh God, no God. Just like really strengthen that sense of love and not a love, like a self-esteem love, not like, no, I'm not bad. I'm so good. Just a me like everybody else deserves to be loved and happy. I want that for myself. Like just that sweet, tender wish, I think is a very powerful antidote. Um, You know, that can be really a good way or like companion, I'd say for the shame work, but it's so awesome that you're, you're seeing it so clearly, you know, even though it doesn't feel good. Um, Well, what you said about thinking like the self-esteem version of that, I mean, that gets me into so much trouble because that's the panic is like, I'm no, I'm doing this right. I'm good. What do you, what else do you want? um, But when you were talking, I had this great image of like, when that's starting to happen, just kind of like looking over my shoulder and be like, oh, where's shame? Oh yeah, shame, come on, come over here. Yeah, I know you're there. So let's just like, you're in this conversation already, so. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, the opposite maybe of shame is is belonging. And so where are the places in our life we have a natural sense of belonging? Um, and, you know, strengthening those or inviting inviting that. Um, I don't think we're going to ever rid ourselves of shame. Like that's a, it's a very core feature of especially our contemporary culture and living situation. Um, we feel under so much scrutiny. There's so much social hierarchy. There's just a, a lot um, endemic to our culture without that sense of belonging alongside it. Um, you know, and shame can be useful, you know, like a healthy remorse. And one thing Sokni talked about last week on the retreat is he was saying, if you've done something that's actually wrong and bad, so a reason to feel shame, right? Um, Okay, like allow yourself to feel remorse and then let it go. And he says that our preoccupation with with bad um, and being bad, it just, it doesn't actually give ourselves um, the credit of, okay, I did something wrong. I'm bad. I can let it go. So he talks about in the context of purifying, like if we've done harm, how do we purify? But unfortunately with shame, usually the content is is actually, it's not, um, it's not reality based. It's projection. So we can't have healthy remorse for our shame. Um, But the, you know, getting caught up in it and getting, um, you know, the sense of, um, defeat with it. It's, I think it's, it's such a worthy opponent. It's such a worthy opponent. It totally deserves all of our struggle because it's, it's so close. It's so close. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. I see Pamela and or Mace has raised their hand. I just feel like that was, I raised my hand and um, it definitely related to what Lindsay was talking about and like a kind of like a self-consciousness when like I express my authentic self and, and like just that simpleness, simple authentic expression can be very triggering for me. Um, and I think I mean, it's great. Like I love, like, you know, I come to Dharma and different things because it's been so helpful to like hear the internal experience of other people. Cause then I'm like, oh, that's just like me. Or I'm just like, I'm like, oh, same thing. Like, cause I tend towards like isolation or separation or like 
you know, and I can have kind of an, a coolness about me that's mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm, I'm all good, you know? Um, so it's, it's just, I just totally, definitely, re- I definitely related what you're commenting on about, I guess, shame. I never would have thought about it that way, but it is that sense of like self that's not secure, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, So I just practice showing up, you know, and noticing my defensiveness and being like, oh, what's that about? And then just <laughs> being brave, I guess, you know, um, by sharing myself anyway um, and feeling the, the heat, you know, um, but also like when other people share, it's like, oh, oh, cool. Oh, good. Like we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for that reminder of just, you know, common humanity. It is such a great antidote to shame. It's very hard to feel like that singular experience of I'm bad and wrong if we're all bad and wrong. Um, So it's, it's such a good one. Um, It's such a powerful one. And, you know, it's funny because obviously in the, it's, I'm like so delighted in the context of Lojong that we get to be so self-reflective because I think sometimes in the Dharma, it's like, yeah, yeah, like let's leave all that stuff behind and go towards this pure land. Um, And that, you know, as, as you have said, Pamela, Nirvana and Samsara are right here together. And like how, I'm not saying we, we try to make our shame Nirvana, but this idea that somehow it won't be there with us if we reached a place that was so, um, you know, delightful and free, like that thinking is very harmful. Uh, and I think with handshake, it's like this small practice of, can I be totally okay right here with this all? And that's the freedom. It's like Jenny said, that's relaxing into it. Like not once I get out of it, but right here, very courageous. Yeah, I loved how you paired the handshake practice actually with this slogan in particular because like it is per- it's a really nice pairing because we get like the analytical, the reflective, you know, and then it's like, no, no, come back. Can we just be here without? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I see from Walt, um, Remorse regarding my actions or lack thereof, especially during the first half of my life, which have harmed others. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then it sounds like, you know, if that's a, an ongoing trigger, right, is I'd, I'd be curious how you respond to it, you know, and does it just continue to um, kind of find that... Um, yeah, that like stickiness and that ache in the heart. Because I think it's, again, healthy remorse is beautiful. I just, I think it's, it's amazing to be able to have healthy remorse for, for harm um, that we've done to ourselves or to others. But when we get kind of real stuck on it, um, it doesn't have a chance to, to like to liberate or purify or, or move through us. Um, yeah, and it is, um, you know, I think about even obviously, even even now and even these days, like, God, are, I'm sure there's ways I'm harming others that I'm not aware of. I'm sure there are. And I can be very um, like humbling and, you know, borderline overwhelming to think of the ways we inadvertently harm others. Maybe we forget to return a call or we just write a really, you know, hasty response and we hurt the feelings of someone we love and uh, out of, you know, you know, whatever. And so it's, it is, it's very humbling to, to reflect on that without getting lost in it. So I, I honor that brave journey. Yeah. Are you able to feel that in the handshake? Well, like that sensation. Um. Yeah, I, you know, I've, uh, I've struggled with this probably, you know, I I went, excuse me, I went through 
pro up until I was um, 40, I was an active alcoholic. And if I hadn't stopped, I probably would have been dead by 45. So I was really into it. And there are people I know I harmed um, primarily emotionally. Um, but then, you know, I'm haunted by the fact that I don't have a clear, a really clear recollection of what was going on in my life. I mean, it's, it's it was like, it was sort of like, I feel like I went, I was insane, you know, for mm. a period of time. And so I don't know how I was interacting, but based on what I do, do know and what I do remember about people I interacted with who were supposedly close to me, it's like, whoa, it scares me and it haunts yeah. me. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it still haunts me. I, I don't really deal with it very well, probably, um, because, you know, some of those people um, are dead. Um, some of them died, uh, you know, a number of years ago. And it's always this feeling of, well, that person whose life I had, you know, a very strong effect on, unfortunately, in a negative way, uh, although they had their own issues, but still, I'm accountable for me. Um, it's like, they died unhappy, and I had something to do with it. Why the fuck should I be happy? Hmm. You know, you yeah. know, what is it? You know, why should I be happy? If I contributed so much unhappiness to that person and that's the way they died so yeah it's it's a struggle yeah thank you for sharing that I really appreciate that it's I can hear it and I actually like it, it literally feel it in my belly like the kind of unease of that sense of oh I harmed others and how can I really fully embrace my own joy um, with that knowing you know, and I, I can't pretend to know what would, what would help, but I, I do think that like, this is exactly what so many practices are for. Do you, I don't know if you're familiar with the story, um, the stories of there's many Tibetan yogis who um, like Angali Mila, who was a um, mass murderer in the time of the Buddha, yeah. you know, and had the fingers around his neck and all of us, right? It's it's that ability to um, to forgive, you know, others, right? That's easier in some ways to forgive ourselves. Like, is such beautiful work, and I do think it is a lot of um, possibly, right? Like, at least as the practices would would have it for us, is um, being able to purify, and that's not like a um, a Buddhist way of bypassing harm. Because it sounds like you've had plenty of time to think of the harm. But then the purification is in just compassion for everything you can remember. And doing Tonglen with all the things that do come to mind, like on the spot. And, you know, I, um, I by no means have any idea about this life, next lives and others. Um, but just because people are dead doesn't mean we still don't get to heal ourselves with them. I think there's a, a beautiful opportunity sometimes once people are gone to continue that healing ourselves and <clears throat> not it's not necessarily selfish, right? It just is, we can't truly know the impact of all of our um, our merit, just like you can't truly know all the impact of, of the harm. And so balancing the two is just, uh, yeah, beautiful and like sacred tension. I would say. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's really <clears throat> meaningful to especially like give some space to that sensation in the body. That's where, you know, the mind and the body, of course, they are in deeply connected system, but 
these thoughts or ideas or these worries live in the body. <clears throat> and then the body's unease can also perpetuate the thoughts and worries. So to be free, which I, I so want for you and for all of us, we work with both um, together. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Milarepa also another example of a very, very bad man who became, not saying you're a bad man, but just someone who just, who became, you know, one of the most cherished teachers in all Tibetan Buddhism, just really, um, and you don't have to set your sights that high, don't worry, you, you keep it, keep it humble. Um, but I, I do think that we're, especially our contemporary culture, we're so bad at redemption. We're really good at blame. We're so bad at like, well, but how do we? And you know, I, we have to do this all the time, every single um, one of us at some degree, because we we blow it all the time, whether it's getting angry at someone we love or something more um, ongoing. But I'm really moved by your share, Walt. I really appreciate it, you bringing that to us. Thank you. Mm. Okay, we I see some hands and we're at nine o'clock. So are they really, can we do a little quickie for the, oh, maybe just one person. Is it Geneva? Do you want to have a, a quick, is it quick or do we want to wait? Um, it's a short story kind of about redemption. It's from Thich Nhat Hanh. Oh, beautiful. Um, he was having a meeting with, um, a bunch of vets that had problems from the Vietnam War. And one of the men for like 25 years had been, his friends were killed by the Viet Cong. And so he set a trap for the Viet Cong with some bombs and some sandwiches. And what happened was some kids came along hmm. and ate the sandwiches and it killed a whole bunch of kids. And what Thich Nhat Hanh told him to do then was to devote himself to helping children around the world. And he had created organizations over the years since Thich Nhat Hanh had talked to him that really helped him. Hmm. And, and um, it was powerful to turn that around to be, you know, he really gave, he opened his heart and gave to those people. And I don't know, um, I, I'm a cat person. Uh, um, my cat from hell, the guy who does that, he got into that because he was having to kill cats in a shelter. Mm. So since then, he's learned, he has saved, you know, like, I don't know, thousands and thousands of cats, if not millions, finding homes mm. for them, teaching people to care for them and train them. Right. Just that turning it Gee. around the other direction to look at something. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, I think it, the, the inspiration of, um, of transformation is there. And, you know, again, it's like those experiences that are um, so hard, either like at the micro level day to day or throughout our lives with various traumas, man, are they instructive, hard to hold and so instructive. Um, feeling a lot of appreciation for the tenderness and openness tonight. And um, let's just take a moment to give ourselves kind of homecoming back into our body, heart, and mind. And connect to the subtle body and notice what may have been stirred by reflecting and listening to one another. Notice if some compassion has been stirred, some sense of care and love. And let's use that compassion that has been stirred here together to consider extending and expanding our aspiration of compassion to all beings. That all beings would know the support of community that all beings would have the chance to see and know themselves clearly. 
that all beings would find the true causes of happiness. So appreciating you all making these practices so real.